<laughs> move halfway down the they, might, they need a reference yeah. voice. No. Oh, sorry. That's great. Great to see you.
salvation history of all that God has done. And we are grateful for it. Amen? Amen. Uh, before you take your seat, uh, we're going to invite our children to come forward for kids' time. Uh, and uh, you may, uh, before you sit down, turn to someone and just greet and welcome them if you would. And then you may be seated. Good morning. Good
Well, thank you again for joining us today. And I uh, just want to share a couple of quick announcements. First, uh, we want to invite you to fill out a pew pad if you haven't done so already. You can find those positioned there in your pews. And especially if you're a guest joining us, would you just let us know you're here so we can call up with you this coming week. We greatly appreciate that opportunity and that privilege. Uh, today, also, if you are giving as part of your library, and you can also give online if you go to simplervillechurch.com slash give, and you can find uh, several different ways to give digitally there at that link, simplervillechurch.com slash give. Now, I invite you to uh, make sure to read the bulletin this week and keep up to date all that's going on. Uh, there's no Wednesday night activity this week because of Thanksgiving. It will all resume next Wednesday. And uh, we also want to celebrate this week uh, that all the things that we were able to give away uh, we work with our local fire department in order to do that, and it's always great to see the community come together. In addition, our uh, children in Sunday school a couple weeks ago, they made a little uh, candy gift packages for the Camden ministry uh, that was they, that handed them out yesterday uh, down in Camden. And so our church has just been thinking about giving out and sharing, and I want to thank you for your generosity. Uh, whether it's in a little way that little candy gift packages to give out, we can't of Jesus when we are generous, when we're giving away from ourselves. So thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, please stay tuned for all of the December activities. We have a pancake breakfast for SJCA. We have something called a gingerbread bash. Uh, the week after that, you'll be learning more about that event coming up. We have a, an Advent hymn sing. So there's a lot of ways to connect in the upcoming months, so please make sure you stay tuned on the bulletin, on the website, on social media. We'll keep it there and all the videos. I'll pause in the midst of it. If there's anything you want to share as a prayer request or even as a word of thanks to God, whether uh, outward, audibly, or just in your heart. And so let's go before God today in a time of prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and the blessings of this life that come from you. But above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace that you give us as a way to connect with you and receive your strength and for the hope of glory. Today we pray that you would give us such an awareness of your mercies, of the ways you're working around these things. Help us to see with new eyes your goodness and your mercy and all the ways you're working in and around us. And with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives. And we may continue to give ourselves up to your service and walk with you before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. To share requests and needs, things in our heart that we might want to share with you. Lord, would you hear our prayer?
praying for. We pray for Susan, who'll be having a procedure. We pray, Father, for Regina, who's preparing for some treatments. For others, Lord, who are on our hearts today, we pray for your healing for them, for your strength for them, that they would not be discouraged, they would be encouraged by the power of your Holy Spirit. Today, Jesus, help us to turn our eyes from the things of this earth to the glory and hope and our struggles, that we might have confidence that you, Lord, are near and you are working for our good and for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you now to uh, join us in our next hymn. It is uh, Victory in Jesus. And one of the things, if you're a follower of Jesus, that we always have assurance of is that the end of our story ends in victory because of Jesus Christ. And this hymn reminds us of that.
the things that I am thankful for uh, is glasses. <laughs> and my prescription remained strong, it was okay, I didn't have to change it, but I told the doctor that my eyes were getting tired throughout the day. So the more that I would read, the, the more my eyes started to get blurry and just kind of worn out. And they told me that I was at that age. <laughs> that age where I needed a different type of lens, a uh, progressive lens, an adaptive lens. And I said, really? Are you sure? In a week or so, it was really kind of weird because I would look and things would seem blurry for a moment and then I would just look a different way and all of a sudden, what was blurry became very clear. And it took probably a couple of weeks before it became second nature, but now I can't really even tell when I do it. It's just instinctive. And uh, I find that my eyes no longer get tired throughout the day, that my eyes have a lot more longevity and strength and endurance. And I shine. And yet sometimes the prescription for giving us greater endurance and helping us being able to continue to sustain uh, our pace and the call that God has for us is sometimes an adjustment of vision. It's a similar prescription. It's not a physical adjustment. It's a, an adjustment of how we see life and how we see circumstances and how we view things. And in the same way, it, it takes a little while to get used to looking at life through those lenses. It can weigh the more we'll find that we'll see things clearer. We'll have uh, a different level of stamina to endure those days that are hard and tiresome and, and cause us to feel weary, that we'll have greater strength for the journey. And I think it all comes back to being willing to give thanks to God and seeing things through a lens of gratitude to our Creator and our Savior. So today we're going to look at a number of the Philippians. He is in prison, and it's a famous letter because... He's in prison, and yet he is saying things like rejoice. And there's this theme of joy and rejoicing throughout the letter of the Philippians. For a, a, a guy who is in jail, in a very unpleasant circumstance, he, is, he has this remarkable vision and remarkable uh, sense of endurance and gratitude in the voice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, Rejoicing here is an imperative. He is not asking, hey, if you feel like it. If it's on your calendar, if it fits into your schedule, rejoice. No, this is a command. He's saying, rejoice. Let me say it again in case you didn't get it. Rejoice. This is also written in the continual sense, which means that he, this imperative, this statement, this, this command, he says, in essence, rejoice. Continue rejoicing. Let rejoicing be part of your life, part of your practice. And that's what it has to be. It has to be rejoicing has to be kind of part of how we view life. It's like putting on a new set of glasses. And it takes a little while to, to, to get used to how they help you to see. But once you keep doing it continuously, it enables you to be able to see life differently. If I was to uh, take off my glasses, I'll perceive them. Be messing up my eyes a great deal. It would cause a whole bunch of confusion because I wouldn't be continuously looking through them and adapting. And if we continually make rejoicing part of our practice in life, it becomes natural. Now, what is Paul saying to rejoice in? He's not saying to rejoice in your circumstances. He's not saying rejoice, I'm rejoicing because I'm in jail, I'm in prison. He's not saying I'm rejoicing because of life is hard. He's saying, I rejoice. It's in God. And this is one of those places where if we can root ourselves in this truth, in this reality, when circumstances that are unfavorable come our way, our rejoicing doesn't have to stop because of them. Because our rejoicing is solidified in one who is consistent, in one who is faithful, in Christ, in the Lord. Paul says, uh, I'm going to break from Philippians for a minute. And Paul talks in, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Have you ever felt like you were outwardly wasting away? <laughs> I think not how that, that looks like. But he's saying we don't lose heart. Meaning that sometimes we feel like losing heart. But he says we don't do that. 
Because we are being renewed every day. He's talking about a strength that he is finding, that the church is finding day by day. And where does that come from? For our light and momentary trouble, the things we hold on to, is that we have this eternal hope, this everlasting uh, promise that we will be with the Lord one day, that God's blessings and promises and what <laughs> God has for us in the future is far greater than anything we face in this life. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, that's why Christians hold, that's why we as Christians hold so tightly to Jesus. It's because that's why, and that's why we can live as give generously. Because our confidence isn't in getting our reward in this life. Our confidence is in Christ and that what he has for us far outweighs any sacrifices we make in this life. Far outweighs anything we can give in this life. Far outweighs any pain or challenges we face in this life. That his promises are so good. And the eternal glory that awaits us in his presence far outweighs everything else. So, we fix our eyes. Paul declares this. Paul is someone, if you read the, the scriptures, he is someone that goes through, he lists at one point all the things he's gone through. He's gone through torture. He's been shipwrecked. He's been snake bitten. He's been rejected. He's been beaten up. He's been stoned. Uh, people tried to throw stones at him enough to kill him. He's been through it all, and he says this. What is seen, what we're going through right now, what you're experiencing, it has an expiration date. It's temporary, but one expiration date. It's the one thing you can count on that's going to continue beyond this life. And so when we rejoice, when we're rejoicing continuously, it is not in all the things that are going on and what we can see in the, in the world around us. It is rejoicing in the Lord, in the promises we have in Him, because what we see is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now Paul goes on back to Philippians 4, verse 5. And I imagine Paul in his prison cell, sensing the Lord's presence, sensing God's presence, even in that moment. And if you've ever been around a follower of Jesus when they've been going through maybe a very difficult time, maybe a tragic loss, there is the authenticity and the reality of tears and pain. But oftentimes you see this alongside that, our remarkable sense that God is near the brokenhearted. That the Lord can bind up our wounds. And one of the promises in Scripture is that while, yes, we have this great hope in what is to come. While we are in the waiting period, while we're in the, the mess of what is now, God is near us. He has not left us to fend for ourselves. God is walking with us. The Lord is near. And so we can call upon his name. We can cry out to him. Now, uh, some scholars, this, and that is the truth for each of us. See, as Christians, uh, when we read the scripture, we believe two things. Jesus came one time. We're going to celebrate that in a little over a month. We're going to begin to prepare for the birth of Christ. But the Bible also teaches that Jesus will return again. That Jesus is coming, not as a baby this time, but as a victorious King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and He is coming and going to make all things new. And all who have placed their faith in Him will come and receive their everything. We are one day closer to that reality. We are one day closer to the second coming of Jesus. One day closer to seeing him face to face. And when we face uh, challenges and pain, that's something we can hold on to. That God is near us in the midst of it. And we can give thanks to God for his presence and his promise. Then he gives this command. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, have you ever felt anxious? And someone told you, no way, but someone's telling you not to be anxious. Because they don't really know what you're being anxious about. They don't know. What the sh they're not walking in your shoes. So Paul does. He says, do not be anxious about anything. But he gives some uh, instructions here. But in every situation, by prayer and petition. So he's, he's saying, you know, he's saying, do not be anxious, but pray. So he's not just saying, just you know, it, it's like if you're trying to, to, to sit there and be quiet and, and try to not think about anything, all of a sudden you think about everything. Because God is near, because God cares, we don't have to live in anxiety and worry and fear. That we can bring 
our requests to God, our petitions to God. We can share with God what is deep in the recesses of our hearts, our joys, our pain, our requests, our needs, and we can come to God with thanksgiving. And when we come to communion, uh, we share what is called a great thanksgiving, and sometimes we do it a little bit differently, but essentially before we get to the, the words where it says, on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, before we get to that point, we say things like, God, we thank you that you delivered your people out of slavery in Egypt. We thank you for the way you've walked with your people throughout all times. We thank you most of all for the works of love and salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. In our prayers and in our prayer time, give thanks to God, reminding ourselves of the one we're praying to. Reminding ourselves of all the ways he has shown up for his people in the scriptures, the ways he has shown up for us in our lives. And then it helps tilt us to the future with confidence. Because we can begin thanking God in anticipation and expectation. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When Paul is writing this, uh, he is talking of, he's using a military language here. And what you'll see, this is a picture of a, an, an ancient military garrison. This isn't necessarily the one in Philippi, but the city of Philippi had a Roman military garrison in it. And when Paul uses this language for the word guard, it's uh, really military language for a military garrison, the people in Philippi who lived there, who saw that, wanted that vision and that picture, they would have been reminded of that very physical and, and military perspective. And Paul is saying that God's peace can guard our hearts in the same way. That God's peace can set up a, a, a military base to help protect our hearts against uh, the things that try and cause turmoil, the things that try and cause anxiety and worry and, and, make, and make us walk around with a heavy weight that God and if you've ever seen someone going through a time in life that is so painful and so difficult, and they're, they're honest about the pain, they're honest about those tears, but at the same time they have this peace. That is a peace that passes understanding. It's a peace that God can, that only God can give in the midst of that turmoil. It's a peace that guards our heart. It's a peace that we can arrive at when we follow Paul's words, when we rejoice continually. When we, uh, <clears throat> when we recognize that God is And so, today I want to remind us just of a few things. If you're a Christian, these are your promises. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, these are the promises that you're invited to receive. This is why we as followers of Jesus can give thanks and rejoice no matter what. Paul reminds us in, in a different letter to the Romans. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. One of the reasons we can rejoice continually is we, in our ability to receive what Christ has done, we now have eternal life in Jesus. In Romans 5, Paul says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We've never earned God's love for one second. Nothing we can do can earn God's love and approval. He died for us while we were still lost in our sin. And finally, uh, in Romans 10, 9, it says, If you declare with your mouth and believe in your heart Jesus is Lord, and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have this promise. That no matter what happens in life, you are loved. I am loved by our Creator, by the one who sent his Son to die for us. That when we are, on our worst day, we have made our worst and most that is good news. And even when all kinds of other things go wrong in life, there is nothing that can separate you or me from the love of Jesus. Now I want to share one last text. This is not from Paul. This is going to the Old Testament from a man named Habakkuk. Habakkuk was known as a minor prophet. It's a small book, only three chapters. In the first two chapters, are Habakkuk basically complaining to God. Have you ever, ever had a prayer time where that was your prayer time? Because on the end of it, God does something where we come out with a greater confidence in him. 
And Habakkuk lived during a time where there wasn't a lot of good news in the, in the newspapers. In fact, most of the things he was hearing and what God was saying was there was going to be some difficult days ahead. He lived in a country that was going to be conquered by a superpower named Babylon. It was going to bring unparalleled turmoil and all kinds of uncertainty into his life and the life of his entire nation. It was going to be something that would have happening and why is this and, and wrestling with God. But by the end of chapter 3, he recognizes that God, in the midst of this, will be with them. And he recognizes there will be a, an expiration date on this turmoil, that it will come to an end. And you look back at history, and it does. It stops exactly when God says it was going to stop. 70 years later. And in the midst of his last closing chapter in his prayer, he says this. Though the fig tree are no grain, the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. You know, we gather on Thanksgiving, we talk about the harvest, right? We give thanks for the harvest. And we think about the going back to, you know, we grew up in school, we up the pilgrims and giving thanks for that, those little the harvest they would have. Odai is saying here, I'm sorry, Habakkuk is saying here, uh, when you look out, there is no harvest in the Lord. It's a defiant type of rejoicing that says, my rejoicing isn't in about what I can see, what I can touch, what I can feel, it is in God. And sometimes we have a lot to rejoice about. The fields are full, so to speak, in our life, speaking metaphorically. And other times it feels like everything there is is barrenness. And the scriptures invite us to say, yet I will rejoice in God, my Savior. Now let me close with this kind of metaphor and, and picture here. And you see the toothpaste tube rolled up like that. And maybe you share a bathroom with someone in your house. And you thought, maybe God would have moved upon their heart to have put in the medicine cabinet a new tube. So that when you walked in, you had something to work with, but you get this. And maybe you're running late that day, and you don't really feel like going down the hallway to the to the closet and getting out a new tube. You just sit there. There's always seems to be a little bit more in there. And sometimes that's what life feels like. It feels like we are in a time in our life when we're trying to look for good things or blessings, and we're not seeing all that. We're just trying to squeeze out every little thing. We're saying, God, thank you for this. These are what I call the every breath moments. They were, sometimes in life, we are just thankful for the next breath we have. We're thankful for the next day's provision that we get. There's not a lot of, when you go to the medicine cabinet in my house, and, I, and when I see that there's only a little bit left, what I'm reminded of is down the hall, there is another full tube. There's more coming. And so even if I'm in the morning where I'm rushed and I have to squeeze some out, I know there's more on the way, a full tube that's coming at some point. And when we find ourselves in life just trying to squeeze out those every breath moments, as a follower of Jesus, the promise we have, a relationship where it just takes your breath away, where God blesses you in a way that takes your breath away, when you think about what the future looks like with Jesus in eternity, and it takes your breath away. Life is filled with moments where the tube is full, and other moments where it seems like it's empty, but there's still some there. The scriptures invite us in all those moments and everything in between to rejoice in the Lord continually, to give thanks. And so today as we close, uh, all of you can, just take a moment and, and in prayer, thank God for three things in your life. It could be a take your breath away moment, something that is big. It could be a, an every breath moment. Thank you, God, you give me breath another day. The three things. And then ask God to give us a fresh perspective on what he is doing in and around us. In essence, ask God to help adjust the lenses we look at life through. So that as we look at life, we can always rejoice in him no matter what. Thanks to God.
God, we give you thanks today for so many things. And we also pray, Lord, that as we are often tempted for our, our focus to be on all the external things that are going on around us, would you help train our the eyes of our heart we can rejoice in you and in the promises we have in you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you and we praise you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with uh, one uh, last song of thanks uh, called 10,000 Reasons. I invite you to maybe think of a few more reasons to give thanks to God as we sing it together.